Welcome, everyone. My name is Joe Sadek. Uh, some of you may not know me. I'm faculty at the VA Medical Center, neuropsychologist here, uh, and uh, a proud mentee of Kathy Hollins. Uh, I'm here to introduce Rachel Hamilton, who's going to do our grand rounds today on frontotemporal dementia. Dr. Hamilton obtained her PhD from the University of Wisconsin Madison in 2019. She's a staff psychologist at the New Mexico VA. She completed her internship at the William S. Middleton Memorial VA in uh, Madison, uh, and then postdoctor fellowship at HRM uh, Health Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center uh, in, um, in Atlanta, right? Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Winston-Salem, thank you. Sounds up. Uh, Dr. Ham Hamilton has conducted research on the mechanisms underlying cognitive deficits in psychopathy, uh, speaking of disexecutive syndromes, focusing on the neurocognitive, psychopathol uh, psychophysiological, and neurobiological correlates of attentional abnormalities characteristic of the syndrome. Her additional research projects included investigation of the cognitive and neuropsychiatric predictors of deteriorating social cognition in behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia and collaboration on a project formalizing a decisional capacity assessment protocol for research centers. As a clinical neuropsychologist, she provides comprehensive cognitive assessments and diagnosis of patients experiencing a variety of neurological and psychiatric conditions with a particular interest in neuropsychiatric disorders, degenerative conditions like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and atypical Parkinsonism and frontal temporal dementia, uh, as well as autoimmune inflammatory diseases, concussion and TBI stroke and seizure disorders. We are very happy to have you, Dr. Hamilton. Thank you for presenting on this always interesting topic and I will let you take over. Thanks, Joe. Um... I'll go ahead and share, whoops, share my screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that okay. So thank you um, first off for having me. So as Joe mentioned, I'll be talking about um, frontotemporal lobar degeneration and related dimension syndromes. So right off the bat, no disclosures. Um, so in terms of what I'll talk about today, first I'll um, go over some terminology um, discussing differences between, between the terms FTD and FTLD, which are um, sometimes used interchangeably both in clinical settings and in empirical research, but they are not synonymous. I'll review some general epidemiological data regarding rates of FTD syndromes and then jump more into each clinical syndrome in depth. I'll go over some things to consider when trying to differentiate FTD from other clinical syndromes, and um, I'll review some recommendations for symptom management, and hopefully we'll have enough time to kind of briefly go over some clinical vignettes. So first things first, FTD versus FTLD, what's the difference? So in brief, FTD describes a clinical syndrome, and FTLD describes a pathological diagnosis. So what does this mean? Um, the term FTD or frontotemporal dementia describes what we see in the clinic, what comes through the door, what we diagnose based on symptoms and patterns of degeneration. And traditionally, there are three um, kind of classic FTD syndromes that includes behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, semantic variant primary progressive aphasia, and non-fluent variant prog primary progressive aphasia. But over time, um, with more research, there has, this category of FTD has grown to include what I'll call FTLD spectrum disorders. So not only those three kind of classic variants, but also logopenic variant, PPA, um, FTD motor neuron disease, and um, some atypical Parkinsonian tauopathy. So specifically progressive supranuclear palsy and corticobasal degeneration. In contrast, the term FTLD describes a family of genetically and pathologically heterogeneous neurodegenerative disorders with predominant degeneration in, you guessed it, the frontal and or temporal lobes. FTD variants are classified based on their respective protein-based inclusions and underlying molecular pathologies. 
And one thing to point out is that some phenotypes, again, that clinical manifestation, corresponds strongly with certain pathologies, while others do not. So in this little graphic here, you can see, for example, we might have a single pathology that maps almost one-to-one -one with a syndrome that, again, we diagnose based in the clinic. In another case, we might have a single pathological entity, um, again, related to the, the underlying kind of protein-based inclusions in, in the neurons and glia, um, but it can present as three different syndromes, so completely deem, um, different phenotypes. And conversely, we can have three separate pathologies that all can manifest in a singular type of clinical syndrome as we see it, which can make kind of diagnosis um, challenging. So this slide here depicts clinical observations uh, or clinical syndromes and underlying disease processes based on pathologic observations made at autopsy and genetic findings. It's from um, neurologist Bill Seeley's lab at UCSF. So up here in this top row, um, we have the clinical syndromes. Below it are the neuropathological proteins. And then finally at the bottom are associated genes. So FTLD is associated with three predominant histologies. We have tau, um, TDP43, and fuse inclusions, with TDP43 and tau accounting for the majority of cases of FTLD, um, anywhere from about 90 to 95 percent. Um, in terms of genetics, FTLD is associated with mutations in three major genes, mapped progranulin and C9 or 72, um, along with some several other less common gene mutations. In thinking about rates of FTD and some things to consider, so FTD is the third most common form of neurodegenerative dementia after, of course, Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy bodies. And it is the second leading cause of early onset dementia after early onset Alzheimer's. The prevalence of FTD variants vary globally, but for the most part, um, behavioral variant FTD is the most common and indeed accounts for um, 50 to more than 50% um, percent of FTLD cases. The average age of onset is somewhere between 45 to 65 for most of the syndromes that I'll discuss although there is a um, small proportion of even earlier onset, and there is a not too insignificant number of folks who present um, later in life, so after age 65. The average symptom time from, or the, excuse me, the average survival time from symptom onset is about six to 11 years, so it's fairly rapidly progressive, but again, that very varies depend on the variant of FTD. And somewhat uniquely, about 40 to 50% of all FTD cases have a hereditary component, which can have important implications um, for discussions with family members in these types of cases. So the first clinical syndrome that I will discuss is behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia, or BBFTD. So this condition was first clinically described back in the late 19th century by Pick. Um, and the term PICS disease became synonymous with FTD as a whole, referring to both the clinical syndrome and the pathological diagnosis. Um, but today, we currently use the term PICS disease um, to describe just the pathological diagnosis, and it's reserved for a specific subtype of BVFTD and, and FTD. LD syndrome associated with this one abnormal tau protein. And you can see um, way down here in the graphic. So the hallmarks of BBFTD are stark personality changes and a progressive decline in social appropriate behavior. Um, in about a quarter of patients with BBFTD, you'll also get some um, motor dysfunction. So that in can include some fasciculations, mild muscle wasting and weakness. And it's common later in the disease course to get some Parkinsonian features like bradykinesia or rigidity. But in terms of the, and I apologize that this is probably little bitty text. Um, this here is the full diagnostic criteria. 
you can see that it follows a three-tier kind of hierarchical classification that stratifies into possible, probable, or definite BVFTD. And this three-tier system is used pretty much amongst all of the FTDs. So the first thing to note about BVFTD, um, which will come into play momentarily, is that it must be progressive. Um, so generally, the time, again, from symptom onset to death is about eight years. To meet a criteria for possible BVFTD, um, someone must demonstrate three of the following six um, symptoms. So behavioral disinhibition, which can manifest as socially inappropriate behavior, which can range from things like inappropriate touching of strangers, um, disclosing highly personal information that would not be something that they should share. It can relate to loss of manums or decorum, so saying rude or offensive, for example, race, rem racist remarks that seem highly out of character, um, and problems with impulse control, so doing things like reckless spending, reckless driving. Um, another symptom is apathy, which can manifest as loss of interest or motivation or just generally reduced initiative. And in extreme cases, um, individuals with this kind of difficulty might need prompts to initiate basic activities ranging from eating to bathing. Another common symptom that you'll find is an early loss of sympathy or empathy. So someone who you know, might have been a very strong family person, might suddenly seem emotionally cold or detached and give a frank disregard to the feelings or distress of others. Um, you can sometimes see early OCD-like behavior. So some perseverations and compulsions that range from fairly simple behaviors like tapping um, or throat clearing to more complex compulsions such as cleaning, collecting, repetitive counting. And then lastly, we have hyperorality or dietary changes. So someone might all of a sudden um, develop an insane sweet tooth. Um, and again, not just that they like an occasional ice cream cone, but will can binge eat on a whole box of donuts. Um, and it really, again, is quite out of character. Um, aside from kind of altered food preferences, they might kind of get bad foods in which they only will eat one type of food or on the other hand, it can range to um, indiscriminate binge eating. And from a neuropsychological perspective, which I'll again kind of elaborate about shortly, typically you see deficits in executive functioning with a relative sparing of memory and visual spatial skills. Although one thing to note is that fairly early in the disease course, despite profound behavioral changes, neuropsych testing from that objective perspective can actually be quite intact. So for a diagnosis of probable BVFTD, and again, those designations are um, specified to reflect certainty in the diagnosis, you will have meet the, met that above criteria, um, have evidence of functional decline, which would check that box for meeting uh, dementia criteria, and there will be imaging, structural or functional, evidence of frontal and or anterior temporal atrophy or involvement. And um, for a definitive diagnosis, that can only be made um, if there is genetic testing done confirming um, some of the common gene mutations, or most often it is done post-mortem at autopsy. BVFTD, as I mentioned, is the most common syndrome associated with FTLD. It accounts for at least half of the cases. It's the second most common cause of young onset dementia after AD. And the age can really vary quite greatly, but the highest prevalence are somewhere between 45 and 65. And something to note is that folks who are diagnosed earlier on tend to have more severe behavioral impairment, while later onset diagnosis, so after age 65, you tend to see more severe cognitive impairment. The average lifespan from symptom onset is anywhere from six to nine years, but because of some of the challenges with diagnosis, um, the lifespan from the time of actual clinic diagnosis is about half that time. And in general, there are no sex differences in rates of diagnosis. So in terms of anatomy, 
Um, BBFTD is associated with atrophy and hypometabolism, evident in the frontal lobes, the insula, anterior cingulate, and anterior temporal cortices. So if we look here, we have a brain of someone with BBFTD relative to a healthy brain. So in this first brain, you can see pretty pronounced atrophy in the dorsolateral prefrontal region up here, in contrast to some of these posterior regions, which look um, fully healthy. Volume loss can also be apparent in the mesial frontal lobes. So you can see here in the um, superior frontal gyrus, the anterior cingulate in these blue stars, and then down here with these little pink stars in the orbital frontal cortex. And in most cases, um, the symmetric, there is symmetric atrophy in those frontal and temporal regions, but with some of the kind of more unique genetic contributions, you might see highly lateralized atrophy with a little bit more common to have left atrophy than right, but um, on the right, you would expect to see more behavioral symptoms. So in terms of specific neuropsychological findings, you'll often see predominant deficits in executive functioning and social cognition. Although, as I mentioned early on, testing can be pretty normal. Um, Loss of insight and impaired self-awareness is the, um, the rule rather than the exception. And it's often seen in up to or over three quarters of patients. So people with BVFTD typically do not recognize or care about the changes, which is in pretty stark contrast to family members who are more often highly distressed by these prominent um, behavioral and judgment changes. So, Oftentimes on testing, you'll see impairments in behavioral inhibition, cognitive flexibility, planning and problem solving. And then in terms of social cognition, which is not always frequently part of a neuropsych battery, but you can see difficulties on tests that involve the recognition of facial emotions. Um, you'll get reduced ability to analyze social norms violations and vignettes, or to make inferences about other people's intentions or feelings. Unlike in Alzheimer's disease, memory is usually relatively spared in BVFTD. Um, although because of some of the executive functioning problems, you can get poor memory and recall. Um, but again, that consolidation, that storage is intact. Um, and other deficits can include deficits in reward processing and potentially buccofacial praxis because of that parental um, motor involvement. And aside from memory largely being intact, visual perception and spatial skills are also generally well-preserved. And depending on if you get someone who has bilateral or um, right-left atrophy, you can see some interesting lateralization on memory tests or other kind of um, lateralized tests with someone with left atrophy showing more difficulty on language-based tasks and someone with right atrophy showing more um, difficulties on right hemisphere mediated tests, so visually based. BBFTD can be a bit of a challenge to diagnose because the symptoms can overlap with other conditions or diagnoses. Um, and importantly, some of these are not degenerative. So there is this construct called FTD phenocopy syndrome. And what that refers to is a diagnosis of possible BBFTD. So again, they check all those boxes with those behavioral symptoms, but it does not appear to progress or it very minimally progresses. So again, the average lifespan of someone with BBFTD is eight years um, after symptom onset. So if somebody has these stark behavioral changes and they're still kicking after 15 years, it could fall into this category of FTD phenocopy syndrome. So it's a heterogeneous category that can um, have different etiologic factors. It can range from family conflict, marital discord, which is not uncommon to see post-retirement when spouses are spending more time together. Um, psychiatric diagnoses that occur late in life. So in general, BVFTD, those behavioral and personality changes are the most prominent symptoms and usually precede or overshadow the cognitive difficulties. And as a result, because of that strong behavioral component, the symptoms can easily be misdiagnosed as a psychiatric condition, such as kind of later onset bipolar disorder, OCD, psychosis, sometimes depression. 
And that type of misdiagnosis is more common in women. Um, and it's important to note that it can also go the other way. So sometimes later onset emergence of neuropsychiatric symptoms might be attributable to a degenerative condition when, um, when they are not, like, or when they are um, initially ascribed to psychiatric problems. And the last kind of more unusual cause um, of kind of this apparently not progressive type of BBFTD is related to a slowly progressive genetic variant that is related to this one specific, the C9 or 72 hexanucleotide expansion, in which this condition you do not see hypometabolism or atrophy in brain regions at autopsy. So the next set of clinical syndromes that I'll discuss are the primary progressive aphasias or PPAs. So this syndrome in general was first described in the late 1800s based on a case of a woman who developed insidious onset, fairly rapid decline in language skills. Um, and then at post-mortem examination, they saw the brain was characterized by massive bitemporal atrophy. The term PPA wasn't really introduced and formalized until about 100 years later with the variants, which there, of which there are three, um, being subsequently defined and formalized. So for a PPA diagnosis, language deterioration is key. So language dysfunction should be the main symptom for the early course of the disease. So a heuristic is within the first two years. Um, and those language difficulties should be the principal cause of impaired daily activities. And while other domains are possibly and likely affected later, language would always remain the most impaired and it should deteriorate the fastest of any other conditions. And something to know in terms of the diagnostic criteria is that a diagnosis of PPA is excluded if presenting symptoms, so those presenting language symptoms are better accounted for by another either neurocognitive disorder, a medical condition or psychiatric diagnosis. So if someone has a massive um, left hemisphere stroke and develops a lot of language-based problems, that would not be, that would be more consistent with a vascular um, type of cognitive impairment rather than a PPA. And again, if there are prominent impairments in non-language domains like memory, visuospatial functioning, or behavior, a PPA diagnosis would likely not be appropriate. PPA is the second most common syndrome associated with FTLD, and it accounts for about 40% of cases. The average age of onset is, again, about 50 to 70. And across the different variants, there are different expectations for life expectancy with semantic variant PPA being the longest and non-fluent variant and logopenic fairly being similar uh, at the shorter end. About 50% of PPA cases develop and progress to include non-language-based symptoms, which usually fall into the category of motor and or behavioral. And that usually occurs within three years of those initial language symptom onset. And most folks with PPA, um, or about 50%, progress to meet criteria for dementia within five years. In terms of kind of gender-based differences, women tend to show more severe language impairment um, and more aggressive decline. And they're still working out the research on why this might be, but there are some kind of initial hypotheses that it could at least in part reflect differences in pre-morbid level of verbal abilities. Women tend to have a um, kind of particular strength in verbal skills, so it could just kind of be that they start off higher and it's more vulnerable to decline. So the first variant that I'll discuss is semantic variant PPA. And this condition is characterized by impaired naming and single word comprehension deficits. Um, and those comprehension deficits are most obviously observed for low frequency items. So if you think about the word zebra, it's something we come across less than something like the word cat. So poor comprehension of single words is usually the earliest and most obvious sign of semantic variant PPA. And it is specifically related to semantic knowledge loss, so the loss of object meaning. 
semantic deficits are not limited to speech and can transcend, whoops, and can transcend modalities. So in other words, that impaired semantic memory or semantic knowledge can contribute to difficulties with object or person recognition, even when it's presented in other modalities aside from verbal. So you can present them with a picture of an object or a real object. You can present, um, have them feel things in the tactile sense. You can present with smells or, or gustation. And again, that semantic knowledge loss can cut across those different modalities. And because of the multimodal nature of semantic loss, there is an earlier designation of semantic dementia. So sometimes the terms semantic variant PPA and semantic dementia kind of used interchangeably, but really the only difference with that earlier designation is that it captures that the earliest symptoms uh, um, that might be present relate to visual um, semantic loss rather than verbal. So if we look over here at their criteria, um, we'll often see surface dyslexia and dysgraphia, which relates to impaired reading and writing with atypical relationship between spelling and pronunciation. So the word S-E-W is so, but a patient with semantic variant PPA might read it as Sue because that is kind of the less, that is the correct, uh, or that is the kind of less common how you might expect to, um, in a more regularized, um, regularized pronunciation. So um, semantic um, patients with semantic variant PPA, they can typically repeat words and sentences. So if we get them in, for example, they'll typically repeat things okay. Um, and their language production is usually grammatically accurate, which will be important in contrasting them to the next variant that I'll discuss. Semantic variant PPA is characterized by focal atrophy in the temporal, um, the temporal polar region, as you can see in this image here. And it's usually um, predominant on the left side. The left temporal lobe plays an important role in tasks requiring semantically driven speech production. So um, because of this, they'll usually do poorly on tests of naming or category fluency, for example, naming as many animals as quickly as they can. And in the cases in which we see right anterior temporal atrophy, um, we'll often see loss of nonverbal semantic knowledge. So that would relate to concepts of social or emotional relevance. Um, an example would be loss of person-specific semantic knowledge. So if we think about famous people, they wouldn't be able to identify. Um, and again, because it's related to that loss of semantic um, information. And because of the, the role of the right temporal lobe in empathy, we can sometimes see features similar to that loss of empathy um, characteristic of VBFTD. So the next variant that I'll talk about is called non-fluent variant PPA. And this condition is characterized by speech production that is slow and halting with output that it is dysprotic with motor speech errors and or agrammatism. So the term agrammatism refers to use of short, simple phrases that omit grammatical morphemes. So a morpheme is a little unit of speech that expresses grammatical concepts like tense or plurality. So the difference between the word dog and dogs with an S at the end, that S would be the morpheme, or bark and barked, the ED at the end of barked would be the morpheme. So um, a defining feature of agrammatism and folks with agrammatism will also have, often have something called telegraphic speech, which if you think about what a telegraph message used to be. Um, it was minimizing words because it was expensive. So this unique telegraphic speech pattern um, has simplified formation of sentences. So if you were to give someone with non-fluent variant PPA a picture, ask them to describe it, it shows picture or a picture of children running in a park. They might um, describe the image as saying, trees, children, run. So again, they take out um, some of those function words and really just stick to the content words. So this video, which again, I'm hoping is gonna work, is a gentleman with non-fluent variant PPA. It affects the telephone 
most, and I used to wave my hands about in facial expressions. I can't do anything like that on the... So hopefully you can see that his speech was very effortful. It was slow. It was labored. Um, another aspect of non-fluent variant PPA that is common is something called apraxia of speech, which relates to an articulation planning deficit. So um, folks with apraxia of speech will often make inconsistent speech sounds with distortions. They'll um, kind of transpose different speech sounds. And this video, I think, kind of nicely highlights it. My name is Gina. I am four, three year old. I ha have um, pause it there, but you can see again for her speech was very slow and effortful and it was just product. So it didn't really flow. She um, kind of put unusual and inconsistent emphasis on different syllables. And um, oftentimes folks with this, if you ask them to repeat a word, they'll say it kind of in different ways at different times. Um, to the frustration of a lot of these patients, they're often aware of the speech mistakes that they're making. Um, and beyond speech, you'll also see deficits in writing. Um, jumping over here to the criteria, um, in non-fluent variant PPA, sentence comprehension deficits are usually influenced by the grammatical complexity of a sentence. So single word comprehension is intact and object knowledge are spared but they have difficulty understanding complex, grammatically complex sentences, such as the use of the passive voice. It's harder to understand than more simple sentence, um, but it's not a problem with the semantic content. And oftentimes in non-fluent variant PPA, we'll see apraxia and rigidity um, sometime in the clinical course. And oftentimes as the syndrome progresses, um, it can include kind of more generalized motor problems that make it look like other motor-based FTLD syndromes, um, specifically corticobasal syndrome and progressive supranuclear palsy. Oh, no. So um, non-fluent variant PPA is associated with atrophy and hypometabolism in the left posterior frontal opercular region. And kind of as highlighted here. And then the third and final PPA variant is logopenic. So the core features of this condition um, relate to deficits in word retrieval and problems with sentence repetition. So you can see word retrieval deficits or word finding deficits both in conversation and on specific naming or language-based tasks in testing. So to give you a sense of how this differs from non-fluent, Spontaneous speech is generally fluent, but it has frequent pauses due to some of those word finding problems. And you'll often hear phonological errors. And I'll talk about what that is in a minute, but contrast this woman here um, with the gentleman that we just saw. About three years, I can't read a book. But sometimes, and sometimes I can't. And in a, in a sentence, I can't make it make sense. If I, even I can say each word, word, I can't make them say what it's supposed to say. It's just like duh, 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 duh. It doesn't come, not, not. So hopefully you can see that again, her speech was largely fluent, but in logopenic variant, you can have what are these kind of islands of fluent speech in between pauses, hesitations, and kind of false starts. And it was pretty subtle there, but you could hear some phonemic paraphasic errors, which is a speech error in which a sound substitution or rearrangement of the phonemes of the word um, is made. But the stated word, you could still tell what she was saying. So she said worth instead of word. Um, and within the context, you can make sense of what she was trying to say. Um, but that is a common error in logopenic variant. And again, 
for her, there was the motor speech was spared and there was no evidence of frank agrammatism. Um, one of the common deficits in logopenic variant and one of the hallmark deficits is sentence repetition deficits. Um, and in general, single word repetition can be okay. And this is because um, the deficits in logopenic variant PPA are thought to be secondary to auditory, verbal, you know, short-term memory or working memory deficits. So they can't hang on to that information in that phonological loop. Um, speech comprehension can be influenced by length and probability of a sentence rather than its grammatical complexity. So if it's longer, again, it can't stick in that phonological loop. Um, and a useful disting distinguishing feature from semantic variant and logopenic variant PPA is the sparing of single word comprehension in logopenic patients. That's right. Neuroanatomically, logopenic variant PPA is associated with atrophy in the left temporal parietal junction, kind of that posterior postilbian um, and or parietal area. And compared to a lot of the other FTLD syndromes, it's most often caused by Alzheimer's disease pathology and can be largely thought of as an atypical Alzheimer's disease. So this slide kind of just sums up the neuropsychological profiles of the different conditions. You'll see that naming is not great in any three of them. With semantic variant PPA, all the deficits are again associated with focal anterior temporal lobe deficits. So you'll do, um, in addition to poor naming, difficulties with category fluency, since that has a strong semantic component, um, verbal memory, that was reading of atypical words, um, single word comprehension. And you'll also see a lot of semantic paraphasic errors. So these differ from phonemic paraphasic errors in that the semantic content is what's getting flipped. So this, um, in this case, someone, instead of saying daughter, they might say the word son. Instead of saying apple, they might say the word orange, which again, they're semantically related, but it's the wrong word. For non-fluent variant, um, again, you'll get a lot of deficits related to speech production. And there is also some frontal involvement just based on the neuroanatomy. So you might also get some executive dysfunction. So you'll see poor working memory, poor planning, problem solving. And um, because again of that more frontal involvement, you can see evidence of apraxia, whether it's bucofacial or idiomotor. And finally, logopenic variant is usually associated with the most diffuse um, cognitive deficits. So you'll get not only that poor confrontation naming, but because of the more posterior involvement, um, particularly posterior parietal, you'll get deficits in calculation skills. Again, that can relate to that phonological working memory. Um, deficits in, in um, again, verbal working memory, you'll get apraxia, you'll get these frequent phonemic paraphasic errors, for example, dat instead of hat, or tephalone instead of telephone, in which things are just um, scooted around a little bit. And um, especially as it's more advanced, it can look similar to um, a, someone with multi-domain um, Alzheimer's disease. So they might be amnestic. They might not be able to retain or store information. Um, they might have deficits um, in attention, visual set shifting, so more executive, and then again, math. Jumping to the next clinical syndrome, we have progressive supranuclear palsy. So it was first clinically described by Steele and colleagues in the 60s as a syndrome of axial, um, again, that's kind of trunkal and neck, akinetic rigidity, supranuclear gaze palsy and bulbar dysfunction, as well as frontal cognitive impairment. And it, at autopsy, was related to this very specific neuropathology. And since that original kind of formulation, there have been a whole lot of other PSP um, pathologies that have been found, but this kind of classic syndrome is now referred to as steele richardson olszewski syndrome, or for short, because that's a mouthful, Richardson syndrome or PSP Richardson syndrome. And that is to distinguish it from other syndromes that have the same underlying pathology. Um, this graphic here just kind of sums that up in a visual format. So in 
the middle, you can see we have a dotted circle and that relates to the um, pathology of um, PSP. And these ovals here making kind of a flower shape or clover shape, they represent the different phenotypes. And you can see a lot of the phenotypes are related to pathology, but not perfectly. So some of these little ovals that go outside the circle are PSP syndromes, again, as we see them, um, but they're related to other pathological abnormalities. And it is uh, of note that PSP Richardson syndrome does tend to have fewer cases that are related to other pathologies. It's more often than not related to the um, PSP pathology. So the classic features of Richardson syndrome include axial rigidity, which is, um, and kind of Parkinsonian features, which are levodopa resistant in contrast to kind of typical Parkinson's disease. You'll see early postural instability with falls. And because of that rigidity, it's, those falls are usually backwards. Again, as you might imagine, based on the name, we'll see um, super, supranuclear gaze palsy, particularly vertical, and I'll show an image of that momentarily. And cognitive impairment is very common and it's common to progress to dementia. So to give you a sense of what that axial rigidity and falls looks like, we have this woman here. Um, you'll see she's very stiff, taking these little tiny steps. And when he pulls her shoulders back, she just kind of crumples. Um, in terms of what gaze palsy looks like, this gentleman here, you can see he can track the pen um, with his eyes perfectly fine in the horizontal plane. But when he's asked to, to look up vertically because of the um, gaze paresis, he cannot. And another common sign or symptom seen in PSP Richardson syndrome is called the Procera sign, which is this involuntary furrowing of the brow that can make someone kind of have this wide-eyed stare. They can look worried or exasperated. And it's thought to be due to focal dystonia of that procerus muscle kind of right in here. Um, so it is a fairly rare condition. The mean age is a little bit later than some of the other syndromes I've talked about, usually starts around age 60, um, and it's rare before age 40. There's a slight male predominance, and the average lifespan is somewhere between five to eight years, but Richardson syndrome, kind of that classic one, is more rapidly progressive than other variants. And from an anatomical perspective, Structural MRI typically shows atrophy in the dorsal midbrain, pons, cerebellum, caudate, thalamus, frontal cortex, and associated um, frontal subcortical white matter. So quite diffuse. Um, one of the hallmark signs on imaging is something called the hummingbird sign. So here we have a normal brain. Here we have someone with PSP Richardson syndrome. You can see that on this mid sagittal view of the MRI, you have atrophy of the midbrain that makes it look kind of like a little hummingbird with a little tiny head and a skinny little beak relative to this one, which might look like some other bird. Um, and in general, you'll have a reduced midbrain brain to pontine base ratio. Pathologic changes, as I've outlined here, are typically distributed throughout the basal ganglia, midbrain pons, and cerebellum. And then cortical involvement is more variable, but more cortical involvement is associated with more cognitive impairment. On neuropsych testing, you'll see predominant weaknesses in those executive functioning and frontally mediated tasks. Um, you might see some, again, retrieval-based deficits, but they are not amnestic. They're able to retain information, recognize it in a recognition format. Um, you'll also see slowing of processing speed and attentional deficits. And sometimes you can see um, some subtle language dysfunction. Next, we have corticobasal degeneration. And with this condition, I'll talk a little bit about some terminology again. Um, it kind of mirrors the FTD and FTLD um, distinction. So the term corticobasal degeneration refers to the pathological entity. So the tauopathy um, that in causes the degenerative process. Um, patients with CBD can present with several different types of clinical symptoms. Um, so there's kind of a classic phenotype and three others which can make anti-mortem diagnosis very challenging. You can see 
Um, you can get one that looks a non-fluent variant PPA. You can get one that looks like um, PSP, but again, they're related to this one specific tauopathy. In contrast, one of those phenotypic expressions, cortical basal syndrome, um, can be differentiated from the rest. And again, it's just the clinical features of cortical basal degeneration. And this is a bit tricky too, because it is also pathologically heterogeneous. So while some cases of CBS can be related to CBD, it can also be related to other forms of pathology. So this condition was also introduced in the 60s, and it was used to describe some patients who presented with progressive asymmetric clumsiness um, and extra pyramidal signs and unusual patterns of asymmetric frontoparietal cortical atrophy, with the atrophy being contralateral to the side of the body where the symptoms were presented. And then at autopsy, they found these specific pathological abnormalities. Um, and today, kind of this cluster of symptoms um, is usually used to reference that classic corticobasal syndrome phenotype. So it's characterized by progressive asymmetric rigidity and apraxia, and you can see both cortical signs and extrapyramidal signs. So this, to give you a sense of that asymmetric rigidity and pretty, the, the stark asymmetry seen in CBD, um, we have this woman here who was diagnosed with possible CBS. Um, and note, oops. Note that her right hand, she's doing just fine on that, that simple motor task, but with her left side, you can see it is much more clumsy. Um, she's slow, bradykinetic. Um, and again, the thing to know about CBD, CBS is that stark asymmetry. Here we'll see some of the bradykinesia. See, she's just really struggling. So these data here that I'm presenting are based on, based on pathologically confirmed CBD cases, not just cortical basal syndrome. So you can see here the motor sim uh, symptoms of CBD include levodopa resistant Parkinsonism, which kind of includes these first um, ones here. You can also get limb dystonia or myoclonus. And you can see that the most common motor findum, again, is that unilateral limb rigidity, up to 85%, um, and that bradykinesia or clumsiness. Gait abnormalities and tremor are common later in the course of the disease, but to make matters complicated, they're fairly poorly categorized. So it's not like someone just presents with the typical Parkinsonian gait. It can look a little bit different. And tremor can be a mix of resting, postural, or action. Um, one perhaps helpful clue is that an early severe gait disorder with falls is suggestive of an alternate pathology other than CBD. So cortical features, those higher cortical um, symptoms are characterized in table two here. So cognitive impairment is very common in, in CBD and it's usually broad. So it typically can impact learning, language skills, executive functioning, potentially memory. The only one that's usually pretty reliably spared is visual spatial function. Uh, behavioral changes are common and can include apathy, kind of bizarre or antisocial behavior, irritability and disinhibition. And again, often we see this apraxia, um, which relates to an impaired ability to perform a skilled gesture with a limb upon a verbal command. So example, asking someone to use a hammer to pound in a nail, asking someone to um, wave goodbye. And most commonly we see idiomotor apraxia, which um, relates to difficulty performing a purposeful learned skilled movement. So if you watch this woman here. Uh, show me how you'd hold a hammer to, to hammer a nail. Writing with a pen. Um. Okay. <laughs> All right. How about if you wanted to use a key to open a door, what would that look like? Mm. Try if you can just do it here a little bit so I can see. So hopefully no one here opens a 
door with a key like that. You can see that she had pretty prominent positions with her hand. She kind of made a lot of the same kind of um, circular movements there, and she had just kind of general difficulties coordinating the movement. And again, in CBD, we would expect that to be um, lateralized or unilateral. Language impairments are frequent in CBD. Aphasia occurs in about 40% of cases and uh, 40 to 50% of cases. And it's usually very fluent to non-fluent, um, non or excuse me, it's similar to non-fluent variant PPA. Um, and some patients may even progress to mutism. With regard to cortical sensory loss, patients can show reduced discrimination of sensation. So they can show something called core graphesthesia, which if you have their hand and you write a number on it, they will not be able to discriminate between numbers. And a feature unique to CBD is something called alien limb phenomenon, which refers to an involuntary um, movement, motor activity in a limb in conjunction with the feeling of its constrangement from that limb. So it's more than just a twitch. Um, someone's hand might kind of act on its own accord. It might fiddle with things. It might open drawers. It might kind of reflexively levitate. But this is only seen about 30% of cases. Um, the general incidence and prevalence are not really well characterized, but in general, age of onset somewhere between usually 50 and 70, lifespans um, pretty short, six to seven years from symptom onset, and there's debate whether they're actually sex differences. Um, anatomically, typically associated with atrophy of the frontal and parietal cortices, basal ganglia, with relative sparing of the temporal and occipital lobes. Um, as the disease progresses, you'll see more posterior involvement. In this image here, in the top, you can see regions of specific um, significant gray matter loss rendered on a healthy subject's brain. You can see largely kind of this um, left parietal involvement. Um, and then rows two and three, you can see significant gray, gray and white matter loss relative to controls. So um, the red represents gray matter, white represents um, white matter. And the neuropsych profile is a little bit less defined than in other conditions. Um, again, because there are is some variation in the different variants of CBD. But generally, they will have pretty diffuse cognitive deficits um, aside from memory. Memory is usually intact, um, but you'll have global cognitive dysfunction, executive function deficits, problems with learning, motor skills, language, again, that graphesthesia, and that lateralized practice. So the last clinical syndrome that I'm going to talk about is um, FTD motor neuron disease, um, which is a syndrome characterized by both FTD and motor neuron disease, as you might imagine. So it involves degeneration of both frontotemporal lobes as well as motor neurons or the corticospinal tract. So about an eighth of individuals, particularly with behavioral variant FTD, have concomitant motor neuron disease. About 30% of patients with ALS have symptoms of BVFTD. So they're, they're quite comorbid. Um, the age of onset of FTD motor neuron disease is similar to that of BVFTD. Um, the important thing to note, though, is that the presence of motor neuron disease with FTD shortens the disease course by almost a third. And there is a slight male predominance that diminishes later on following menopause. So again, symptoms include those behavioral and or language changes seen in BBFTD and progressive muscle weakness um, and upper and motor, lower motor neuron signs seen in ALS or um, more general motor neuron disease. And bulbar weakness, so again, that impacts speech production and swallowing, um, is overrepresented in FTD motor neuron disease relative to just, just general motor neuron disease. Here we have a graphic kind of summarizing that spectrum going from ALS on one hand, ALS with behavioral impairment, executive cognitive impairment, non executive cognitive impairment. ALS FTD, in which someone meets full criteria for both, FTD motor neuron disease, and FTD on the other side, again, most frequently BBFTD. And in terms of brain changes, you often see widespread frontotemporal atrophy, um, less frontal atrophy than kind of pure BBFTD, and um, 
this down here just sums up gray matter loss in VBFTD with motor neuron disease compared to healthy subjects. So again, a lot of front, frontal, a lot of temporal. So some things to consider for diagnosis. So over time, as you might have caught the gist of, degeneration tends to spread, symptoms tend to overlap, um, making it harder to differentiate the different syndromes. Um, and there's also some overlap between FTD sim sim symptoms and syndromes and non-FTD symptoms. So FTD can present with executive dysfunction, Parkinsonian features and hallucinations, which sounds a heck of a lot like dementia with Lewy body. Um, BVFTD can also mirror kind of other atypical ADs in which there's more frontal involvement of the AD pathology. Um, and then psychotic symptoms are not infrequent um, and they're not mentioned anywhere in any of the current diagnostic criteria for FTLD conditions. And because of that complexity, differential diagnosis should never just be based on one test. Um, it should follow the consensus criteria for each of the conditions and incorporate neuroimaging and neuropsych, which has been shown to greatly increase sensitivity in detecting FTD, as well as kind of the standard medical workup. And lastly, I'll kind of brief through some considerations for symptom management. So in general, um, psychopharma um, pharmacological treatments aren't super duper helpful. Um, here are some of the common ones. Um, for treating the agitation, aggression, disinhibition in behavioral variant FTD, but you can see um, the effects are not um, stellar. Oftentimes, um, interventions aim to modify the environment, so building a stable structure environment, teaching caregivers how to effectively use redirection or um, distraction, offering simple choices. Um, and early on, it's important to have discussions of safety, so future planning, um, driving and firearms, all of those fun discussions to have with patients. And caregiver support is pretty critical as again, usually this, these types of behavioral conditions impact family more than the patient um, or seem to distress family. For language symptoms, speech therapy is generally one of the most helpful um, treatment approaches. It can help compensate for progression of language loss. Um, and it can also be rehabilitative, so it can help stimulate the language system to slow down decline. And finally, motor symptoms are best treated with OT and PT. Um, medications, again, aren't really helpful because some of those Parkinsonian features are levodopa um, non-responsive. And it's important to note that if someone's diagnosed, particularly with BVFTD, they should be monitored fairly closely for about a year or two two to see if they develop any motor neuron dysfunction. And there, this is a great free resource. I encourage you to Google it. Um, it includes a lot more recommendations specifically. So I am going to just kind of jump ahead. So I have a couple clinical vignettes if people are interested in, um, in the last couple, five minutes here, but I'll just briefly summarize. Um, well, just to make a note, we have about two minutes left. Uh, two minutes, oh no, my timing was wrong. Okay, well, I will go over this in one minute and then and then we'll leave some time. So um, FTLD clinical subtypes can be lumped into behavioral language motor variants, um, and a person is lumped into one of those based on the um, initial symptoms that arise. Um, and hopefully you can kind of have gathered from the talk that symptoms overlap and de-differentiate over time, which can make um, clinical diagnosis challenging and clinical syndrome does not equal a pathological diagnosis. Um, and everything that I just spent an hour talking about can be very nicely summed up in this slide here, um, which just features all of the different FTLD spectrum conditions and the characteristic features. So with that, I'll leave that one minute for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamilton. And, uh... If you're willing to stay on and people have a few extra minutes, we can do some Q&A afterwards, and I'll point out some very helpful comments by Dr. Richardson in our chat about uh, logopenic and omphalan variant uh, variations. So uh, anyway, don't forget to sign up for your CEs, and uh, we'll stay on for any anyone who wants to have some questions. Thank you.
Right. Think, uh, no, no questions in the chat uh, that I could see. Lots of praise, a very nice comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Hamilton. And um, yeah. Will the slides be available for us to revisit? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to make them available. Um, if the best way to do that, I don't know if Yep, Robin, you're still on. Would would it be best to send them to you, I'm Robin? Yeah, if you could send them to me, and if anyone who is interested uh, wants to see the slides, I'll put my email in the chat and just let you know. I'm going to warn you because of the video clips. Um, my email was very mad that it's it, like too big, so I, I included the links for them. Um, and I'm, but I might have to remove them just so that the email sends. <laughs> But I'm happy to send send the links that'll direct you right there. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Where did you get the videos, Rachel? I found them from a couple different sources. I went to some neurology websites where they were freely available, and um, there were some on YouTube that were um, they were kind of little case snippets from folks who were involved. It, it was a whole whole long thing about PPA, but they. Um, included that so very helpful thank you i know they're kind of weird things in, unless you hear it you're like oh <laughs> that's what she's talking about so. some great praxis apraxia examples yeah. all right i think that's a wrap Thank you, everyone, for your attention. And, um, thank you, Dr. Hamilton.